All right, so what we have here is basically a ultra budget um, build for someone that's not a gamer, just a regular user. Um, to put it in perspective, they're coming from a desktop PC that was still running Windows XP. <laughs> so I think it was probably a Core 2 Duo at best. And so we really didn't need anything high performance. Um, so obviously a Ryzen 3 quad core uh, is going to fit the bill. And to be honest, this is also based on what was in stock at the store. Um, this isn't stuff that I, you know, went to different websites looking for the best deals. This is just I walked into a store and picked what they had on the shelf. So, for example, they had the Ryzen 3 3200G, but they didn't have any of the older 2200Gs left. And considering the budget that I was trying to hit, if they would have had the 2200G in stock, I would have went with that. <laughs> really, it's this was to, to be done as cheaply as possible. Um, what we're looking at here is about $325 US, um, so that is a case with a power supply. Normally I don't go with cases that come with power supplies, in fact, cases that come with power supplies are pretty rare. I mean, in this entire store they had probably 100 cases in stock, and two of those were ones that came with power supplies. Um, this is a Cooler Master Masterbox Light 3.1. It says with dark mirror front panel, um, and then it came with two red LED fans and a 500 watt power supply. I assume it is about as basic of a power supply as you can get. Like, I'm thinking non 80 plus certified, non active power factor correction. So, we'll see. Um, everything here was brand new and sealed, basically. Well, the motherboards never come sealed but brand new. Uh, everything was brand new except for the case. The case was open box, 10% off. Um, someone actually bought the case with an ATX motherboard, got home and started to build it, and then realized this is only a micro ATX case. It won't take a full-size ATX motherboard. So I was like, whatever, that's fine. All the screws were there. It's 10% off. Again, did this on a super budget. Really, the only thing that we didn't quite cheap out on all the way is, uh, well, again, the CPU. I would have went with the 2200G if they had that. Even if it was only like $20 cheaper, um, who cares? It's like 5% slower or something. And um, they did want an SSD, and I assumed they would probably want some, what, like not, not a 250 gig, but at least a 500 gig. Again, could have went with like an M.2 SSD, might have been like ten dollars more, but ten dollars for performance they're never going to notice again it doesn't matter it's just a standard sata based s s d the w d s are very good though um w d owns sandisk now, and uh I mean these have a five year warranty on them they're great s s d s sort of middle of the road uh price wise they're not as expensive as the samsung they're a little bit more spent expensive than like the Kingstons or the a datas so they're a good, like, right in the middle, uh, price-wise, and they've been uh, really good, so. Um, we got 8 gigs of RAM, again, considered going 16, but considering they're coming from, again, a Windows XP machine, and it's going to be very light use, I think 8 gigs is going to be fine. It is a single 8 gig stick, it's not dual channel. Uh, again, I was going with what the store had in stock. They had a lot of 16 gig kits, like two 8 gig sticks in a kit, but they didn't have a lot of 8 gig kits where it was like two 4 gig sticks in a kit, and so I went with a single 8 gig. Um, obviously dual channel mode is a little bit faster, but <laughs> realistically, uh, to be honest, the average user is not going to notice the difference between single channel mode and dual channel mode performance. Uh, the motherboard, as you've already seen, is an Asus B450M-A. Never used this particular board, but I have used a lot of B450M. Uh, B450 is obviously the chipset. Um, usually the letter M in a motherboard model number is telling you that it is micro ATX. This is a micro ATX motherboard, not a full-size board. Um, great for the purpose we're using it for. Um, because it does have VGA, DVI, and HDMI. 
on the motherboard. And um, assuming this computer is as old as it is, I don't know if the monitor is equally as old. So the monitor might have VGA. So it was good to make sure that the motherboard had VGA on it. So whenever I'm doing a build, um, I start with uh, the motherboard uh, CPU and RAM. So I'll put the case aside, I guess put the SSD aside for now. If it was an M.2, uh, we would keep it out. Grab a knife just to open the CPU packaging. And the RAM. And then what I do... Take the motherboard out of the anti-static bag and I put it right on the box that it came in. Uh, you don't want to put the motherboard on the outside of the anti-static bag. Uh, that's a no-no. Um, so I just do it right on the box. Uh, I mount the CPU and the RAM without, you know, before the motherboard is in the case. I've always found that is a lot easier. got the AMD Ryzen. Uh, this is a quad-core processor. Um, the base clock is 3.6 gigahertz and the boost clock is 4 gigahertz and then it has built-in um, Radeon Vega 8, I think it's Vega 8, yeah, Radeon Vega 8 graphics built-in. So that's the key really is we're not going to be running a separate graphics card. Okay. Line up the CPU with the triangles, should drop right into place, and clamp her down. Uh, one strange thing with the new AMDs, the AM4 socket, is the motherboard still have these plastic brackets on there with the two clips, like they've been using, um, well, AM2, AM3, very similar setup. But some of the stock AMD coolers don't come with the bracket for that. Some of them actually screw into the back plate. So it's very strange that using a stock cooler we're actually going to take off the brackets off the motherboard, but that's the way it is. Um, I think the Wraith and the Wraith Spire, the higher end uh, processors that come with the higher end uh, coolers, I think they still use the clips or at least some of the models do. But the lower end ones, like the 2200G, for example, came with a very similar cooler to this. So we'll hang on to those um, in case the cooler ever gets changed down the road. Basically just put them back in the box with the motherboard when you're done. And then this can go one of two ways. Depending on how everything else is lined up on the board, I guess we'll go like this. And then it's just four spring-loaded screws holding the stock cooler on. Tighten until they stop. They are spring-loaded. springs tend to make a nice noise like that. There we go. So that's screwed right into the back plate. And we don't use the clips. Uh, the CPU fan power header. Looks like that is right here. We can twist it or tie it or find some way to somewhat keep it out of the way, but we're not too worried about wire management here. Basically just like that. Uh, only one stick of RAM, not dual channel, so I believe we're going to want to put it in the closest gray slot to the CPU. But I will double check that when we're done. For now we're done with this, now I move on to the case. Alright, first thing I do with the case is take both side panels off, not just the side you need to get the motherboard in. 
Uh, this is just um, acrylic, it's not actually tempered glass. It will scratch easily. Little pieces of the styrofoam stuck to the case from the static. Now, without the back side of the, or the, the right side side panel off, you're good to lay the case down like this while you work in it. And you don't have to worry about scratching the, the side panels. So we got the power cable and all the screws and some zip ties typical stuff that comes with a case. There are two red LED fans in the front. It looks like there is that's interesting. They've got a Molex connector going to three fan headers and two of them are already plugged in. Obviously, we'll only use that if we have to, uh, depending on how many fan header, uh, fan case headers there are on the motherboard. We'll worry about that when we get there. The power supply. Cooler Master Elite V3 500. Doesn't have the voltage selector switch on the back. So it might actually be active power factor corrected. Uh, but it doesn't look like it's 80 plus certified. There's no 80 plus logo on it. So I knew that the power supply wasn't going to be anything special. But again, considering this build, no dedicated graphics card, we're talking about a system that's going to draw probably under 200 watts. 200 watts at the most and it's a 500 watt power supply so we'll be fine we have front panel USB 3 front panel HD audio we have a front panel USB 2 header and then all the normal um, power switch and power light and hard drive light Normal front panel headers. Uh, we have two USB ports on the front of the case. One is a USB 2 and one is a USB 3. Hence it needs the headers for both. I really hate it when they do that. That's typical on cheaper cases. More expensive cases, usually both ports would be USB 3. I don't understand why they do this. This header right here is the standard, um, I think it's a 20 pin connector. Um, but this is the standard front panel USB 3 header and this is technically two USB 3 ports right here so they're only using half of this and then you have the USB 2 one and why they do that and not just use both USB 3 ports I've never really understood that but the cheaper cases tend to do that alright first things first don't forget the IO plate the rear IO shield just pops in there like so. Now we'll make sure all the standoffs are in place. They probably will be, but we'll double check. One nice thing I like about <laughs> mounting the CPU cooler on the motherboard first is it makes the motherboard really easy to handle. You can actually just hold it by the CPU cooler. It ain't going anywhere. It's got four screws going into the metal back plate. So not all the standoffs are in place, so we're going to need to add one, two, three, four, five. Oh God, six, seven. Assuming they're all. Yep, we can add all seven.
Sometimes, depending on how deep the motherboard is, you don't actually end up using the furthest row from the back plate. But here we are. So, I put the hardware out with all the screws that came with the case. And they actually give us a tool to use a Phillips screwdriver to screw in the standoff. So, standoff goes into the little nut driver thing, and that's got a Phillips head on it. That is fairly common. I would say most cases come with that, but definitely not all of them. Sometimes you actually need that tool yourself. Or you end up just doing them by hand. Have fun getting them tight enough. <clears throat> I got the motherboard in place. All the standoffs are in the correct spot. That's one common mistake, is make sure you've got all the standoffs in the correct spot. Another common mistake I was going to make a joke about was adding thermal paste to a stock cooler that already has thermal paste pre-applied, but then I forgot to make the joke. Um, another thing to check is when you put the motherboard in, is make sure none of the metal grounding tabs on the I.O. shield uh, you can maybe just... oh, this flashlight's too bright. Uh, on the top of the HDMI port, and on the top of the USB ports, and the network jack, and the PS2 ports, there's a little metal flap that you can sort of spring up a little bit out of the way, and make sure that they aren't getting caught in the ports at the back. It's another common mistake. Um, so yeah, that looks good. So we're going to screw the motherboard down. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, eight. I thought the one in the middle was a... Uh, sometimes the one in the middle is just a bump uh, to hold the motherboard in place. Uh, but here it is also a screw. So I will screw the motherboard in, and that will be that. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Got all eight screws holding the motherboard in. Uh, now I will move to all the front I.O. I'll do the power supply after that. So we have the front panel audio, the USB 2, the USB 3, and then power switch, reset switch, power light, and hard drive light. Um, there are two chassis fans, uh, headers, one there and one up there by the CPU. Uh, but the fan cables aren't long enough to reach this one. I might actually take one fan out and put it in the back, and one will reach the front, and the back one will reach the back, and that might be a little better for airflow, because we don't have a fan in the back anyways. Um, one thing to note on the front panel headers, the power switch and reset switch, uh, the polarity doesn't matter, it's just a, it's just a momentary switch. Um, the power LED and the hard drive LED, the polarity does matter. Uh, I don't know if you're going to be able to see that with the flashlight pointing at it. Um, but it does actually specify uh, power LED minus and power LED positive. Uh, plus and minus are labeled on there. And uh, so the positive is always the one to the, the far left or like pointing towards the back of the motherboard usually. Um, it should be labeled and the motherboard should also... Uh, show up a, a picture of that if you're not sure, but if your power LED or your hard drive LED aren't working after you build a new computer, it's probably because that's backwards. Um, I've even seen one time where the case was labeled backwards. The one that said power LED positive was actually the negative, and the LED didn't work until I reversed it um, opposite of what it should have been, and then it worked. So, yeah, I'm going to switch the fans around. So wire management is mostly done. Um, we've got the front fan connected to the header up here and the rear fan connected here. So we didn't end up using this spaghetti monster thing. Uh, we're going to do the SSD next. Uh, it looks like it goes here. Not the prettiest spot for it with the kind of wires going this way instead of out the back. But we'll figure that out. Uh, as for the power supply... Got the 24 pin connected uh, into the motherboard, and of course the 8 pin up here. 
Uh, the case doesn't have a hole up here to run that behind the motherboard uh, tray, so again, on a cheaper case, that's not too uncommon. Uh, but I'll get the SSD uh, SATA cable run, we'll get the power hooked up to it, and then we can tie the rest of these up and we'll be done. Alright, gonna hit the power button for the first time. I got a Windows 10 installation on a USB stick in hand. Yay, that works good. Let's hope that's just the power switch at the back. <laughs> yep. So I see the red LED fans. And power LED seems to work. And it looks like something's happening over here. And we have posted. New CPU installed. Of course, it's the first time it's been on that motherboard. We'll go on to the BIOS settings. Or the EUFI. <laughs> UEFI. <laughs> I'm old school, I'll still call it the BIOS. Uh, we got 8 gigs of RAM. Looks like it's running at 2666 by default. It is 3000. I will worry about that after installing Windows. Detecting all three fan speeds, the CPU and uh, both chassis fans are on the headers. So we've got speed sensor on both chassis fans. CPU temperature is good. And we see the 500 gigabyte uh, Western Digital SSD. So we should be good to just pop in the USB stick. Get a look in there. And not much to see even though that red LED fan is right there. And we will reboot. Yeah, I won't see that USB stick so I think we're gonna have to reboot. should just detect the USB stick and start installing Windows 10. So uh, we'll get back when that's done. Alright, Windows 10 is installed. Uh, I pointed out the power light. Uh, also there is a hard drive uh, activity light there, as you can see, blinking. Loading Windows 10. And we're in. It's about as fast as you would expect a modern computer with a solid state drive to be. Uh, takes a few seconds to boot up. I've done all the updates and uh, I've done a little bit of stress testing with Prime 95 just to make sure the temperatures are all in check. And honestly everything looks good. Uh, we have the 500 gig SSDs got 439 gigabytes free uh, after Windows being installed and obviously the way Windows shows uh, hard drive size versus manufacturer. Don't need to get into that right now. Obviously quad core at 3.6 gigahertz. Um, 6 gigs of RAM shows up. 2 gigs is going to the video. So we only have 8 gigs of RAM in this and it is onboard video. Uh, but again for light use it should be fine. Um, it is pretty peppy. Uh, for light use, uh, and uh, again, this is someone coming from a machine with Windows XP on it, so this is going to be a rocket ship.